Hey, um, as we talked actually about some really important stuff, what are some things you can think about in your life that you've lost before that are really important? Um, maybe your keys. For some of us, it may have been our car. Uh, your phone, wallet, uh, a credit card. Uh, maybe it was one of your kids. Yeah, this actually happened to us when our kids were a whole lot smaller. We uh, were at the mall. We were shopping for our kids. I can't remember if it was like right before school started and we were getting school clothes or it was during winter time or it's just that rhythm like every two weeks you got to buy your kids clothes because they grow out of them so fast. I don't know what it was, but we're at the mall. We're in the kids' department. We're looking through all the racks and, and Kara comes up to me, my wife, and she says, hey, Chad, where are the girls? There's no right answer for a guy at this point, right? <laughs> I, I can't say to her, well, uh, I thought they were with you. Wrong answer. Um, I don't know. It's a definite wrong answer. So I just kind of stood there for a second. I looked at her. I was like, uh, and that really is the right answer at that moment because you really don't know. <laughs> we go into panic mode, right? Because if you don't know where your kids are, you go into panic mode. And so we're looking up, and I'm looking all around, and I'm looking at, at the, the, where people are walking. I'm looking over in this area because I'm a little bit taller than my wife. She's looking through all the clothes, and, and we're yelling out, Savannah, Avery, Savannah, Avery, where are you girls at? Finally, we hear giggling. And it's giggling that we know because it's giggling from our two girls. We follow this giggling over to one of those circular clothing racks. We open it up, and right in the middle, sitting on one of the metal bars, are both of our girls laughing hysterically because they thought it was the funniest thing in the world until mom and dad had a conversation with them, and then it wasn't that funny anymore. <laughs> Maybe you've lost your kids in that way. Maybe you've lost them in a worse way than that. Maybe you've lost something that's really important to you. But when we lose something that's important to us, we'll do whatever it takes to find it. This morning, we continue this series called The One. And in this series, we've been talking about the one. Uh, we're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the birth of Jesus. But we're even talking beyond that. Because, again, sometimes we look at the birth of Jesus and we wrap it in this nice little package. And we, we put this wrapping paper around it. It's real pretty. Put some ribbons on it and a bow. We're like, oh, just think about the beauty of the story. And it is an incredible, beautiful story. But we don't, we don't really think about the purpose of the birth of Jesus. Because there was a purpose to him being born. And we really find this when the angels are talking to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 10. They say, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. When we see those words from the angels there, they tell us the purpose of Jesus' birth. The purpose of Jesus' birth was to bring this good news that was going to bring great joy to all humanity. That the Savior, the Messiah was going to be born. And so if you know the story, they, they tell the, these words to the shepherds, but, but they're, not, they're, they're not like, hey, you know, just hold on to this information. Now they go to them and they're like, hey, don't take our word for it. In fact, here's what we want you to do. We want you to go find Jesus. And so the shepherds leave. They go experience Jesus for themselves. They see Mary. They see Joseph. They see the one. And then they leave and they hold that information to themselves, right? No. They go into all the, the region there. They go to the, the city. They walk into the streets, and they just start telling people, we got great news. It's going to bring great joy. It's amazing. The Messiah, the, the Christ, the Jesus, he's been born. See, they knew what they were supposed to do with that news, that they weren't supposed to hold it to themselves, but they were supposed to share it with the world they lived in. If you and I, if we call ourselves followers of Christ, we are called to do the exact same thing. We're not called to know about the good news and experience this joy and keep it to ourselves. We're supposed to spread it. We're supposed to let this out into the world that we live in. And so not only are we talking about the one in Jesus in this series, but we're talking about the ones that are in our lives. Those people that we know, we love, and we care about that are important to us, but we also know they're lost. Like they're far from Jesus. And what do they need? Well, they need to hear the great news, the good news that brings great joy to all people. As we started this series last week, we were talking about how in this series, we're looking at the Christmas story a little bit, but we're really looking at three parables that Jesus gives us in Luke chapter 15. And I want to go back to the very beginning of Luke chapter 15, kind of to remind us what's important here and what this lost person may look like in our life. Luke 15, starting with verse 1 says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, 
even eating with them. I talked about how Jesus and the Pharisees, they kind of had this tension between them. The Pharisees are about systems. They're about rules and laws and regulations. And and Jesus is about relationships. He's about connections and and bonds and and hanging out with with people that are far from, from God. And so as we began this series, I asked you last week, I said, Start to think about who your one is. Who who is that person in your life that you know is lost and is far from Jesus? And and I asked you not only just to think about them, but I said, start praying about them. So start not only thinking about who they are, but start praying about them every single day that that God will help you build that relationship, build that connection with them so that, that maybe at some point in time, you get to have this incredible conversation with them about who Jesus is and and the purpose of Jesus coming to this earth. But there's another piece to this today. I told you last week I wanted to give you something practical as you figured out who that one was in your life. When you came in this morning, there should have been two of these cards on your seat. I want you to grab those, if you will, right now. And here's what I would love for you to do. This is extremely practical. There should be a pen in the seat in front of you. If you know who that one is in your life, I would love for you on the back of that card, I would love for you to put in that name. Just write that name. And in fact, write that name in both of those cards. And then here's what I want you to do. I want you to take the one card and I want you to keep it. I want you to put it in your pocket somewhere, put it in your wallet, put it in your your car, uh, maybe put it, tape it up to your mirror in your bathroom, somewhere where you're going to see that name every day. It's easy for you to remember. And I want you to pray for that person every single day. But then here's what I want you to do with the other card that's got the exact same name on it. As you leave today, there are offering boxes. There's one in the back here in the back of our auditorium. There's another one that's going to be out right in the middle of the the walkway as you go out in the lobby today. I want you to drop the other card in those boxes because we don't want just you praying for your one. As a staff, as a church, we want to begin praying for them too. And so we invite you to do that. So as you're praying for them, our staff, our leaders, our prayer team, we're praying over these exact same names. And maybe because we do this together, God will move in incredible ways in the one's life who you love and you care for and who's so valuable to you. All right? So I want you to do that. That's your practical thing today. Do not forget about doing that today. If you're still thinking, think about that, fill those out, and then put those in the offering or one of those in the offering box as we leave today. But I think there's something important that we need to know about the one. There's another question we've got to ask. And we're going to go back to Luke chapter 15. We're going to start with verse 8 because Jesus actually gives another parable. Here's what it says. Or suppose a woman who has has 10 silver coins and loses one. Jesus gives us some pretty intense details here, very specific. She's got 10 coins. She loses one. Why is this important? We'll give you a little context here. Scholars are pretty positive that as a woman was getting married in that time frame, in that culture, uh, the, the father, her father, would give her these 10 silver coins. This was pretty important because this is the one piece of property that this lady who was getting married, that no debtor or, or anybody they owed a debt to couldn't come and collect that money from her. That was hers forever. And so what they would do often is they would take those 10 coins, they would connect them with some silver chain, and they would make this really elaborate headdress. And and so when this person was getting married, when she was getting married, she'd have her veil on and they'd put these 10 coins, this headdress on her head. Kind of like our our engagement rings of of today. And so as you can imagine, as you think about this, this jewelry was was precious. Uh, It was important. It was special. and, And it was valuable. And so if she were to lose one of those coins, and each one of those coins was about a day's wage in that time, if she were to lose one of those coins, I mean, it would have been heartbreaking to her. And so she would have done anything possible to find that lost coin. We see that in the rest of verse 8. It says, won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? Up here on the screen, it's a picture of a 1794 flowing hair silver dollar. This is the most valuable minted coin that has ever been publicly traded. In 1792, the United States mint began, and as it started up, it was just minting copper coins. But then about two years later, they started minting, in 1794, they started minting silver coins. This silver coin is specific because this silver coin is actually still around. Now, here's the deal with that silver coin. It was sold in 2013 for $10 million. $16,875, $16,875, or better for us, it's more connected to the price of a gallon of gas today, right? <laughs> Whew. 
Well, let's say you own this coin, right? Your kids were playing with it one day for some odd reason, or you stuck it up on the counter, and you go back and you can't find this coin. Would you kind of think, you know what? It's just a coin. I'm not real worried about it. Look over there. I got a big whole thing, container of, of quarters. I'm good to go. No, no, you, you wouldn't think that at all. You, you'd see that coin, or you'd go looking for that coin, and you would do anything that you could to find that coin that was missing. Why? Because it's, one, it's valuable, $10 million worth of valuable, but it's also something that is valuable to you. Here's this lady. She loses one of these 10 coins, and she does everything possible to find it. Now, this would have been tough in her environment, especially in homes in those days. There's a couple of things about these homes you need to know. First, they're not really big. Uh, they were probably about one to two rooms. One of the rooms would have been quite large or, or larger. It had been living space. Uh, there would have been a back room that may have been more for supplies. At, at night, this is actually where you'd put your animals to protect them and to keep them warm. And so you've got this home, and it's not real huge, um, but it's dark. Uh, these homes had a door on them, and then a few of them had these 18-inch across circular uh, windows. You, you didn't have a big bay window overlooking the golf course. I mean, you had this little tiny window and a door, and that was it. That was the only light that, that was coming in. And then the floors themselves... They didn't have carpet, they didn't have vinyl plank, uh, they didn't have painted concrete. It was compacted dirt. And, and then on top of the, this dirt, they would put dried reeds, they would put rushes, and they'd lay that on top, kind of like our carpet of today. And so if you can kind of imagine what that was like for her to go find this valuable coin that's lost in that kind of setting. I mean, I mean it tells us what she does here. She, she grabs a lamp. She lights it so she can see what she's looking for. She, she grabs a broom or something to sweep the floor, sweep the entire house. And then as you, she does this, she's, she's searching for this, this one coin that's lost. And she keeps looking for it until she finally found it, finds it. I want you to think about all that effort she put into that. Think about the determination that she had to go look for this coin, the, the willingness to get down in the, in the rushes and the weeds and the, and the dirt, anything it took to find this coin that was lost. When you lose something valuable in your life, like we talked about a little bit earlier, what are some of the things you've done to find it? You've probably grabbed the lamp, right? You grabbed the broom, you got your hands dirty. Because you'd be willing to do anything to find that one thing that was lost. Now let's take this and let's talk about it in terms of the one in our life. What would you be willing to do to reach the one in your life who is lost? What, what would you be willing to do to, to find that, that person in your life that you love and you care for, that you know is far from Jesus? What would you be willing to do? Well, I bet if they were valuable to you, you'd grab the lamp you sweep the floor, and you'd get your hands dirty to find them. There's a great example of this, I think, in the book of Mark. It's an event that takes place in Jesus' life, a miracle that we see that happens in Mark chapter 2. Starting with verse 1, it says, When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. So Jesus goes to Capernaum. This is sort of his ministry center. This is like Jesus' headquarters. Uh, this is home base. Uh, he'd go there to, to maybe rest a little bit, to hang out with some friends, connect with some family before kind of heading back on, on the road to travel around and keep doing what he was doing. But Jesus had a really big problem. He was like a celebrity. If Jesus was around today, paparazzi would be following him all over the place. TMZ would be around him at all times. Uh, you and I, we'd have our phones out when he was around. We'd be videoing it and taking pictures and putting it up on social media. I mean, this is who Jesus was. And so anywhere he would go, people would hear that he was there. And then everybody would start congregating exactly in the place that he was located. He couldn't get away. He, he couldn't hide. So he's there in Capernaum. Everyone hears that he is at this one particular house. News starts to spread pretty quickly. And so people start to show up at this house. They're there because they want to see him. They want to hear from him, and a lot of them want to see him heal people, and maybe even themselves. And so this place is, is packed out. Uh, look back at Mark chapter 2. It says, while he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. 
They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. I'm guessing this house wasn't much bigger than the lady we just talked about who lost this coin. It's, it's small, but people are inside. They're packed out inside. People are all outside the house. They're trying to listen through that little 18-inch window. They're trying to listen through these little doors that are there. These four guys show up with their best friend, one of their good buddies. He's paralyzed, and what they want is they want Jesus to meet him. And more than that, they want Jesus to, to heal this guy. But there's so many people there, they can't get in the house, they can't get through the crowd, so they're resourceful, right? It's like their Eagle Scout kicks in, or maybe they were engineering students of Virginia Tech, something like that's going on. They decide our best move is to go through the roof of this house. Now, when we go back and we see that first little, or that last little um, passage there, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head, the actual translation, the literal translation of that says, they unroofed the roof, <laughs> They unroofed the roof. Usually these homes, they had stairs going up the side, and the, the, the top of the house was, was flat. And so you'd have these stairs, and it was sort of a multi-purpose room for you, room, if you will. Uh, you'd go up there for a peace and quiet. You'd go up there to pray, to rest. And maybe you'd take people up there. You would eat. Um, I mean, it was just a, another section of this particular home. And, and actually, it was pretty sturdy. Uh, they had these flat beams that they would lay across wall to wall with about a, a three-foot gap between each one of these beams. And in the space between these beams, they would fill it with, with brushwood and clay, and even they'd put manure in there. Now, as you can imagine, this was pretty nutrient-rich, and in, in fact, quite often, you'd see grass would be growing on the top of these, these homes because of that. But these roofs, they, they, were, they were sturdy, they were watertight, but if you think about those elements, they were pretty easy to dig through. And so these guys bring their buddy there, and they start digging through this roof. Why are they doing that again? They want their friend to meet Jesus and to be healed by Jesus. And so they're willing to do whatever it takes to make this happen. I want you to think about all the years that you have been here on this earth and I want you to think back and think about what is the, what's the greatest thing that anyone has ever done for you? I'm not talking about some gift they gave you, okay? I'm not talking about they gave you jewelry or vacation or car or PS5. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what is the best thing that someone has ever done for you in your life? Maybe for you they were a surrogate mother, Maybe for you, they adopted you into their family. Maybe they gave you an organ. Maybe they gave you financial help. Maybe they helped pay for your education. What's the, what's the best thing someone has ever done for you? And then I want you to take this a step further. What's the best thing someone has ever done for you in your darkest and hardest moments in your life? That's someone who was there for you when your spouse told you that it was over. Or that person that was there for you and they, they held your hand when the doctor came back and said, hey, that cancer hasn't gone away. Or, or maybe that person that was there and they supported you when you, your parent passed away. What, what's been the greatest thing anyone has ever done for you in those life moments? And as you think about those moments in your life and what someone's been willing to do for you, my question back to each one of us is then what would we be willing to do to reach the ones in our life? Because when we look at these four buddies right here, they, they see their friend and he's paralyzed. He's not living his best life. They're literally, we talked about this last week, they're literally carrying his burden for him. And they look at him, they're like, he's important, he's special, we want to care for him, we want to love him, he's valuable to us, we want to help him. And so they're willing to do whatever it takes to do just that. They're willing to get their hands dirty. They're willing to stick their fingers into the manure of life to get him what he needs. And you know what he needs? He needs to meet Jesus. We go back to the parable, and this lady, she loses her coin. It's important to her. It's precious. It's special, and it's valuable. And she tears her home apart. She gets her hands dirty so that she can find this one lost coin. 
What would you be willing to do to reach the one in your life who's lost? Again, are you willing to stick your hands in the dirt and the manure of someone's life to help them, to support them, to guide them, to be there with them? Are you and I, are we willing to do what it takes to reach the one who's far from Jesus? Because when we do, there's an incredible outcome, I believe, that comes from that effort we put in. Back to Mark chapter 2. It says, Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. I love this because Jesus heals him, right? He heals him and he says, Your sins are forgiven. But there's something about this passage that caught my eye as I was going over it over the past few weeks. It doesn't say anything about the paralyzed man's faith. See what it says there? It says Jesus sees their faith. He sees the faith of these four buddies who are helping their friend who want him to be healed. They want him to be better. Jesus recognizes their faith. And as I I read that passage, it seems to imply that their faith, what they were willing to do is a main reason that this man is healed. And as I read through that, it kind of hit me. I wrestled with these words. I wrestled with Jesus' actions because I started to point the finger at myself. And I'm thinking as I'm reading that, could my faith in Jesus have the power to influence God to change my one's life? Or could it be me who's holding back Jesus at work in someone's life? Because I'm not willing to get my hands dirty. But because I'm not willing to unroof the roof. And maybe I don't think Jesus can actually do something in someone's life. Maybe I don't think Jesus can change someone's life. Maybe I don't think it's important. Maybe it's time for me to check my faith. Maybe it's time for you to check your faith too. Because I read that and I think, I've got a huge part to play in this. And what am I willing to do to reach that person who's far from Jesus? What would you be willing to do to reach that person? And are you the one who's holding back God doing an amazing work in someone's life? Are you willing to grab the lamp and sweep the floor and and get your hands dirty? Are you willing to get the cuts and the bruises and, and get the manure in your fingernails because that one person is so valuable to you that you would do absolutely anything to reach your one? And do you have the faith to believe that Jesus can change them? Maybe that's the question that you and I need to wrestle with. And maybe we need to wrestle with that question is how valuable is that person to us? We talked about last week how someone matters to God, they should matter to us. And if your one matters to God, they should matter to you. And if they're valuable to God, they should be valuable to you and to me too. Because the incredible part is I believe when we focus on this and our faith is in the right place, There's an incredible celebration that can happen. We see this back in Luke chapter 15 as we go back to the parable that Jesus was teaching. It says, And when she finds it, she would call in her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. We talked a little bit about this already, of this uh, battle, this tension that's there between the Pharisees and, and Jesus. But the religious leaders actually had a saying in that day that connects back to what Jesus says here. Here was their saying. I think put it up here on the screen here in a second. It says, there will be joy in heaven over one sinner who is obliterated before God. You read that and you're kind of like going back to what I told my wife. It's kind of like, uh, I don't think that's the right answer there for, for that. Basically, these Jewish leaders are saying, hey, if, if you're lost, you're lost. If you're lost, you don't matter to me. You're not worthy of, of my time and my effort. And oh, by the way, you're also not worthy of God. And so here's Jesus who's actually pushing these leaders. He's hanging out with the tax collectors, the notorious sinners. He's, he's there with them. He's eating. He's, he's building relationships. He's spending time with them. He's like, these people actually matter. And you're forgetting about them. And it's why he tells the story of the lost sheep. It's why he tells the story of the lost coin. And if Jesus is saying this is important, then it must be important to us. And so are we spending that time in our life to look for and find that lost soul? Because Jesus is reminding us, hey, they are very valuable to God, and they should be valuable to you. 
This shouldn't be about rejoicing when people are sinning and when people are living a life that's far from Jesus. We don't celebrate when people are obliterated. We celebrate when people come to know who Jesus is, when the lost are found. And that's what we are called to do as followers of Christ. We're called to find the lost. And the reason is so we can share the hope of Jesus. And really that is the Christmas story. If we go back and we look at the Christmas story, we look at some of the main players in it. We've got Mary and Joseph. I I want you to kind of put yourself in their position. Mary gets pregnant before she's married. And in that culture, I mean, that was one of the worst things that this young lady could have done. And so there's no telling how much pressure was on her, how many words and and, and gossip and the slander and rumors that, that went towards her and Joseph and their family. I'm guessing the religious leaders in that day looked down upon her and they were like, she's not worthy of anything. She's lost. She's a sinner. Maybe God will obliterate her. And and then you think about Mary and Joseph and they get together. I can't can't even begin to imagine the marital strife that was there at the beginning. Now, I know Joseph hears from God, but there's still probably some questions there and he's trying to figure this whole thing out. And so there's this, maybe this moment of loss of hope. When you look at the shepherds, Uh, They were outcasts in that society. The religious leaders called them unclean. They're like, stay away from them. Don't get close to them. And so they they were just nobodies in in those communities in that day. Then we got the Magi. They show up a few months later. They they come in. They're foreigners. They're from a different place. Uh, They're outsiders. They worship all these different gods. And again, these religious leaders like, hey, you know, glad you're here. When are you leaving type of thing? And and so you look at these major players within this, this Christmas story And the religious system at that time would have said, you're not worthy. You're not worthy of God. You're not valuable. Look at who you are. Look at what you've done. Look at the life you're living. Look where you're from. And yet we go back and we look at Luke chapter 15, and Jesus reminds us that there's value in all people. And not only is there value in all people, but there is a hope that is there for all of us. It goes back to the words of the angels, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. What those words meant was that hope had arrived, that there was value in each person, and because of who they were and because of the value they had in God, they had value to humanity. There was hope that was there. There was hope for Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the magi. There's hope for the tax collectors. There's hope for the notorious sinners. There was hope for the Pharisees, the religious leaders. There was hope for humanity. There's hope for you. There's hope for me. There's hope for the lost ones in our lives. But you and I, if we call ourselves followers of Christ, we're called to share that hope, that good news that will bring great joy to all people. Because God was willing to send Jesus to this earth to get his hands dirty, to bring hope, and to show the value that each of us have. And as a follower of Jesus, we're called to do the exact same thing. Are you willing to grab a lamp? Are you really willing to sweep the floor? Are you willing to get your hands dirty to bring hope to your one? We live in a hopeless world. We, we look around and we see that people are trying to find hope and definition and define their lives and success and then they're finding that life is hopeless there's only one thing that brings us hope and that's jesus christ and as a follower of jesus each of us that are we are called to spread that good news of that hope so that our lost ones can experience the joy of knowing who jesus is Again, as you leave today, I invite you to take your one card, drop it in our offering bin so we can be praying for your one. And I invite you to take your other card and take it home and just be praying for that person. And let's see what amazing things God will do. And let's see what kind of celebrations we get to have together as more and more people who are lost find that hope that only comes through Jesus Christ.